The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Well, good morning and welcome to Oxford United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Caleb. We are so glad that you have joined us for worship this day. And we also want to extend a happy Mother's Day to our mothers and also acknowledging that the, the gift of mothering extends beyond uh, what we typically associate with motherhood. So we want to recognize that this morning and also know that this day is fraught with many emotions for people. But the good news of God's grace is that God meets us where we are and provides his grace all the same. And that is the reason that we have gathered for worship today. Well, would you join me in a moment of prayer as we get into our worship this morning? Oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, would you rise in body or in spirit as we sing together, Seek Ye First, hymn number 405. Open the gate, the shepherd is coming. No stranger voice will we follow. We follow only the one who brings us home. Amen. And now, would you join with us in singing Amazing Grace, hymn number 378. We will be singing the first three verses.
as we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning, morning um, I invite you forward to light uh, a candle if you wish during this moment of meditative prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather this morning in mind, body, and spirit, we lift our prayers to you with hope in addressing the concerns of our hearts. Please hear our prayers. Father, we pray for peace. We pray for peace in our hearts. We pray for justice for the wrong. We pray for acceptance for the abandoned. Lord, we pray for mercy for the oppressed and love for the marginalized and equity for all. We ask for the courage to live our lives as Jesus did with his never failing love, compassion, and grace. Father, we pray that you would blot out our inequities and embolden us to be the light for you that you meant us to be. Let us be your ambassadors to our family, our friends, and our community. Bless us, Lord, that we may be fruitful and life-giving to those in need of love and grace in whatever way that means. Father, this is a special time in our community and in several, several others across the nation as students graduate or head home for the summer and as our own children wrap up the school year at <clears throat> school year in preparation for their summer vacation. Lord, we pray traveling mercies for all the families heading home or on vacation. We pray mercies for the graduates. May you bless their lives as they begin their merge into the lane of life of independence. We pray for the graduating students from high school as they spread their wings to leave the nest. Protect them and give them courage to do good in your name. We pray mercies that all who celebrate will do so safely to live a full life filled with your blessings. On this Mother's Day, I wish to pray a prayer by Hannah Carden, pastor of Elston Avenue United Methodist Church of Chicago. To the moms who are. <clears throat> to the moms who are struggling. To those filled with incandescent joy. To the moms who are remembering children who have passed and pregnancies that miscarried. To the moms who decided other parents were the best choice for their babies. And to the moms who adopted those kids and loved them fiercely to those experiencing frustration or desperation in infertility, to those who knew they never wanted kids in the ways they have contributed to our shared world, to those who mothered colleagues, mentees, neighborhood kids, and anyone else who needed it, to those remembering moms no longer with us, to those moving forward for moms who did not show love or hurt those they should have cared for, Today is a day to honor the unyielding love and care for others we call motherhood, wherever we have found it and in whatever ways we have found it to cultivate it within ourselves. Amen. I pray a special blessing this day. If you have loved another, if you have cared for another, if you have shared in the joy of another or lifted up another and comforted another, may the Lord bless you this day and every day. Let our hearts and minds rest on him, the provider of all, night and day as we pray, our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, for our announcements this morning, Jerry, do you mind fixing our uh, computer screen there this morning? Jerry, could you... Well, as I say every week, um, make sure that you take the yellow insert in your bulletins this morning, fill it out, and along with any tithes and offerings, you can place those in the baskets as you depart at the conclusion of today's service. We do have a few other announcements to bring to your attention. Number one, it's just a few more weeks until we go into our summer worship schedule. So May 28th, Memorial Day weekend, we will start our 10 a.m. worship services for the duration of the summer. Um, so for those of you, if you show up a little bit late, you're going to be showing up to my sermon, right? Because that's usually around 1030 time. So just remember that in a couple weeks. Also, you may have realized that in our uh, Friday update, we put in a little um, information about something special that is happening for Stan Toops, who passed away a few months ago. His wife is traveling to go to the vault that they have for him to place his ashes in there. And so what we have done is we have taken a picture of the church, uh, and it's down in the narthex, and we are asking people to sign that because it will be placed in the vault um, with his ashes. So if you would do that, we would uh, love to get that to her as soon as possible so that she uh, can get that done. And then lastly, we continue to uh, invite people to come to one of our discussion groups that we have based on the sermon series, based on this book, You Are What You Love. And I will say this, you don't have to read this book to come to those discussion groups, because guess what? My sermons are on the chapter. So, and I kind of give you a little bit of what the whole chapter is about in my sermons. So as long as you're following along with that, you have more than enough to discuss. And so we just had the first two this last week. It was really good to gather with people. And so I would invite you to come to one of those. And you can mix it up. You don't have to go to all of them. Um, you don't even have to go, like if you go on a Sunday night one, you can go on a Wednesday as well. Uh, because we're going to have different people there, and it's really an informal time to discuss the sermons, but also this book together. Uh, it's a great way to grow together as one body and learn from one another. Well, that's all my announcements for you today. Now, as we shift into the message, you know that we are on week three. We've had two weeks already. We're on the third chapter of our books. In the first book, we focused on the title of the book itself. The first week it was, You Are What You Love. And that was just a general survey of the fact that our hearts are made to worship. And discipleship is about curating the heart. We learned that our hearts act as two things, as a compass and that they direct us and point us in a direction, but our hearts also are the engine of our lives. They propel us forward and go in a certain direction. And so our hearts then are an important piece to who we are. And discipleship is about that heart. We often think of discipleship as the stuff we think about. Who Jesus is, what scripture is. But no, we are not just thinking things. And discipleship is not just about what we think. It's about what we desire, about what we love at the deepest core of who we are. That's what discipleship consists of. And then last week, with chapter 2, we learned that you might not love what you think you love. You might say, I love God, but the pattern of our lives reveals a different kind of love. And that's why James K.A. Smith says that we need to practice the spiritual discipline of awareness, of becoming attentive to all the things in our lives that seek to derail or distract us from Jesus. We say we believe in Jesus, but maybe we're operating out of what James K.A. Smith calls a rival liturgy. 
And those rival liturgies come in all shapes and sizes, but all of us participate in liturgies at all points in our lives. And the example I gave last week was what? Starbucks, right? There's a liturgy when you go into Starbucks. They literally have their own language for the drinks that you order and the sizes that you order. They have their own language, their own environment. You just get the sense, you know, when you go into Starbucks, you're going to place your order, you're going to go see, sit down, and then they're going to call your name, right? It's a part of the liturgy of Starbucks. And so this word liturgy is an important one for us to understand because there's all kinds of these rival liturgies competing with our attention to Jesus. And as we become aware of them, that's the biggest part of it. It's just becoming aware of them so that we acknowledge them and the ways that they shape our lives. Not all of them are bad. Some of them are good liturgies. It's just a part of it. I'm not here to judge Starbucks. I'm not here to judge your smartphones either because there's a liturgy to smartphones as well. I'm here just to say we need to be aware of those. And if last week helped us to be aware of rival liturgies, this week we are going to focus on the right liturgy, the nature of our worship. But first we got to attend to the, the book of worship itself. And I'm referring to, of course, the book of Psalms, which are a collection of songs that, that we read, but were sung unto God. And so today, our scripture comes from Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may we receive your word this morning your word which is to us, your word which is for us. And so, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What is the purpose of worship? Regardless of who you are, how old you are, how young you are, you were made to worship something or someone. It's by design and who we are as humans. We're either worshiping God or something else in our lives. So it makes sense then if as humans we worship something that we would want to attend to what it is we actually worship. As James K.A. Smith mentioned in the first chapter, you are what you worship is equal to you are what you love. Because ultimately, you worship what you love. What's ever foremost in your heart, that's what you worship. And so if we as disciples of Christ want to be true to God, 
and true to our faith in Jesus Christ, then yeah, we want to know not just who we worship, but how we worship. The second part of chapter three's title for this week, the first part is the sermon title this morning, The Spirit Meets You Where You Are. So the second part, the subtitle is Historic Worship for a Postmodern Age. Now, what does that mean? Historic worship for a postmodern age. Well, in short, what it means is drawing from the well of the past in order to know how we can worship God rightly today. And I always differ differentiate for people. There is a difference in living from the past and living in the past. As followers of Christ, we want to live from the past. We want the past to inform how we worship and how we live as followers of Jesus Christ. But we don't want to live in the past. That means essentially that we're stuck in the past. And we're not paying attention to what God is doing around us even now. So James K. Smith is, is drawing us into an important clue of worship. We look to the past to learn from the church, which through time has struggled, through time has spread, through time has been faithful in worshiping God, and we learn from them. That is why the structure of our worship is, is similar. It's why our services here have a familiar yet not frozen structure to them. And I say familiar because when you walk into worship, maybe a few things are different, but it's familiar enough. You're like, okay, I get where this is going. We're going to start this way. There's going to be a few hymns, and then this is going to happen. Caleb's going to get up here and talk for God knows how long. And then, you know, we'll depart and do that. We get that familiar. But I also say it's not frozen because it's not meant to just stay the same way it was 60 years ago or 100 years ago. And this is where I think we come to see that, you know, the purpose of our worship services is to help us be more true to our worship of God. It's not just something to do on Sunday morning. We just happen to do it every Sunday. It's something that is life-giving to us and actually helps us in our faith to grow and be more faithful to God. That's what worship is designed to do. As James Smith points out, worship is the arena in which God recalibrates our hearts, reforms our desires, and rehabituates our love. Worship isn't just something we do. It's where God does something to us. Worship is the heart of discipleship because it is the gymnasium in which God retrains our hearts. There's two things from this. Number one, the centrality of God in our worship. And number two, the centrality of worship to our discipleship. So if we want to be faithful disciples, we need to focus on our worship because worship is all about God, placing God at the center of our lives. That means that worship is not optional or incidental. It's a part of who we are. Worship matters. But as James K.A. Smith points out, form matters. It's not just that we worship that's important. It's how we worship God that's important. Some of you have probably clued into this through the years that um, in the United Methodist Church, and I've said this to people before, if you go to a United Methodist Church, don't be surprised if they worship a little bit differently than the way that we worship here. I like to say, if you've been to a United Methodist Church, you've been to a United Methodist Church. And some of you have seen through the years, it, it changed. Some of you predate when this denomination was formed in 1968. You remember what it was like before it became the United Methodist Church. And the United Methodist Church really is like a hodgepodge of different expressions and different personalities. And we get that all the time. It's true for any church, really, not just the United Methodist Church, but, but a great many churches. 
But the United Methodist Church, it seems like there, there's something interesting about it enough that we allow for all the different expressions to occur, and that's okay. Some other churches are like, no. Like McDonald's, I want to make sure that the Big Mac I get at one McDonald's is the same at another one. Well, that's not how it works in the United Methodist Church. You're going to get a different meal each time you come. Because we're potluck people after all, right? I mean, just consider this fact. This is the third United Methodist Church that I've had the privilege of serving in. And this church prays the Lord's Prayer different than the other two United Methodist churches. The first church I went to, they were the debtors. The next church was the trespassers, and you guys are the sinners. Everybody does something different. And the temptation when it comes to worship, I think, and this is at the root of where we go astray when it comes to how we worship and what we do with our worship, is that we often turn it into something that is less about God and more about us. That's really at root for all of the debates and arguments people have, the flared tempers. You don't worship the way I do, and I don't like the way that you worship. And the danger here is the same that lurks behind every tradition, every style, and every form of worship. The danger is we want it to be about us. But here's the truth that we need to hear. It is not about you. Our worship is about God. And there's several ways that we go astray when it, when it comes to worship. And the main way I think that we do this is when we turn worship into an ism. You know what I'm talking about this morning when we, we put that ism at the end of a word and it becomes a thing unto itself. And so there are four areas that I think congregations, not just this congregation, but any congregation can fall prey to. These are all the isms, or just some of the isms, rather, that, that we might uh, be inclined towards. James Smith points out, and he spends the most time on the first of these, expressivism. We live in a day and age where it's all about your experiences and, and how you are, are feeling with something. And, and, and it's less about what declaring what God is doing. Like in the psalm, it's ascribe to God and more about ascribe to me. I want to experience something with this. I want to feel excited. I want to feel satisfied with worship. It's turning things back in on ourselves. That's what expressivism does. And as if almost in hand in hand with that, or alongside it, is consumerism. It's where we take just the fact that, that we as people, we have to go out in the world and shop for things, right? We're consumers of goods. We're consumers of items. We, we consume a lot of things. We consume technology. We consume television shows. That's, that's who we are. But when you take that and you bring it into how we worship, that's when things get strange. I mean, consider how strange it is that when people are looking for a church, they say they're going church shopping. That's a word we use, right? I'm shopping for a church. Same way I'm shopping for something else out in the world. Friends, you can't build a church on consumers. You can only build a church on disciples. Because once you turn worship into a consumeristic thing, then it becomes all about you. And then every experience in worship is as if you're shopping. Well, I like the, 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 the music over here at this church, but I don't like the preaching there. Oh, I like the, the, the people over here, and, and oh, I don't like the way that the, that building looks, or, or I don't want to worship in a traditional church. I want to worship in a strip mall. Like, it's shopping, right? We're consuming things in our worship, and that's why we have to be aware that that's a thing in our lives. And if we turn worship into that, 
things get strange really fast. I kid you not. They once served a church where they had various contemporary bands that would lead worship on different Sundays uh, of the month, kind of like how we do volunteer stuff here. And one Sunday, I, I had people come to the doors where I was greeting people as they went in, and they looked in, and they saw what band was on stage, and they're like, oh, they're playing today. I'm going to go home. And they left. Worship for them was dependent upon the band that was on stage that morning. That's what happens when you turn worship into consumerism. But to go in a different direction here for a moment, another dangerous form of worship is traditionalism. Now, I want you to hear this morning that tradition is a good thing. And I'm not calling out the fact that we're consumers or even that experience or expressing ourselves is a bad thing. Those things can be good and of themselves, but once you turn it into an ism, that's when things can get bad real fast. And with traditionalism, uh, what I mean here is, is the mentality that this is how we have always done it, and then almost as if it's unspoken with that, and this is the only way to do it. That's traditionalism. I just want to live in the past. The way we were in 1968 was good for me. Let's just stay there. That's when traditionalism can, can really take our eyes off of Christ, just like these other isms. It gets us obsessed about what happened in the past, and we can't see what God is calling us to do in the present. And then the last is clericalism. Oh, that's a good churchy word, right? Like, what clericalism? Well, how is this a temptation of the church? Well, this essentially is when people make the pastor or the, the, the leader of the church the center of their whole experience, as if they are living their faith through their pastor. And this is not just some old school word, because I know clerical, like a lot of people don't go around, like I don't introduce myself to people and say, yeah, my profession is I'm a clergy member. Like, they just don't use that language anymore. But what I do see is evidence of, of pastors who, who make themselves the center of everything in their community. We see, even today, celebrity pastors who have their own television programs, their own podcasts, and I wonder, as a pastor of a church in Oxford community, where do they get the time for all these things? But see, it becomes about them, and people attend the church because of them. So you see how this can be dangerous when the pastor is not just an authority figure within the church, but becomes the authority figure to the point that everything has to revolve around that pastor. Friends, this is not what worship is designed to do. And so when we attend to the structure of a worship, how we worship really does matter. And worship or liturgy, however you want to put it, should really, when we get to the root of it, ready and prepare us to be transformed by God's grace. That's all that worship is meant to do. We don't just show up because we have to or because it's something that we do on Sunday mornings because there's nothing else to do on this particular Sunday morning. No, we show up because we want to experience God's grace. And the thing that we have to understand is there is no formation without transformation. We all want to be formed in a particular way. I want to be a better Christian. Well, you could go about a set practices. You could come to worship every Sunday morning. That's not going to make you a better Christian because there's only one thing that's going to make you a better Christian, God's grace. No formation without transformation. God is the initiator. God is the one providing this. I mean, think about it. A piece of clay cannot shape itself. A potter shapes that piece of clay. So when we come to worship, that's what God is doing to us. The clay of our hearts is being reshaped and reformed that we might serve God more faithfully. And yes, we should be concerned 
with the form of our worship, but not to the extent that we forget the spirit. Clearly, form matters, and I truly believe we got to stop turning worship into some sort of ism. But I think there are two aspects of worship that help us fulfill our duty to worship God more than any other. Now, Smith only focuses on one here, and as you could probably tell if you're reading the book, he does not care much for the word innovation or novelty. Some of you are like, yes. I like this dude. He likes history and the old things. And yes, he does. But he does have words to us that point us in a different direction than just living in the past. And I think, as Methodists, we, we really, we live into both of these pretty well. That's what I would argue is unique to us, but one of our greatest witnesses to our fellow uh, children of God because I think we are able and well positioned to do both. So what are the two aspects of holy worship? They're simply these, repetition and interruption. Now repetition, in churches we think of repetition as a bad thing, or maybe perhaps like a necessary evil. Like we don't, we don't, we don't like the idea that we have to repeat things over and over and over again. We don't, we don't like that because when we do that, it doesn't feel good or authentic. We, we want to be spur of the moment kind of people. But the truth is, all of us are creatures of habit. And your habits will win out every single time over your thoughts. Because they are the, the, the deep pattern of your life. In fact, all of our lives are one life of endless repetition of repetitions. We do things, we practice things over and over and over again. And so James Smith says this, if you think of worship as a bottom-up, expressive endeavor, repetition will seem insincere and inauthentic. He's talking here uh, about the, the kind of repetition when we pray the Lord's Prayer every week. There's some people that think that's inauthentic and insincere because you're just playing the same prayer over and over again. You need to make up a new prayer every single time you pray. He goes on, but when you see worship as an invitation to a top-down encounter in which God is refashioning your deepest habits, then repetition looks very different. It's how God rehabituates us. And here's the thing. Repetition is considered a good thing in a lot of other areas of our lives. But for some reason, when it comes to worship, we think of repetition as an ugly, negative thing experience. We want something new. Don't want the organ. We want something more to excite us. And with that news, since we need to update things and get things moving because we don't like repetition here, next week I'm going to put a lot of fog machines in here and we're going to like get some strobe lights and, and all that stuff. We got we to gotta bring ourselves up to date. We got to do something new because this stuff is just getting old. It's insincere. It's repetitious. But James Smith goes on. He says, we willingly embrace repetition as a good in all kinds of other sectors of our life to hone our golf swing, our piano prowess, and our mathematical abilities, for example. If the sovereign Lord has created, created us as creatures of habit, why should we think repetition is inimical to our spiritual growth? That's a rhetorical question. The answer should be obvious. Repetition is not something that is inimical to our spiritual growth. As Methodists, we literally have it in our name, Methodists. We're all about order and doing things in a repetitious manner. And that's because we think of worship as an invitation to a top-down encounter with God. And so repetition is not something that steers us away from God's Spirit, but rather brings us into it. This is why John Wesley and the first people that gathered together, known as the Oxford Club, they, they, they met every week. And on certain days, they did certain things. 
Every Saturday, go visit those in prison. They repeated that over and over again. Repetition is a good thing. But John Wesley also knew something else. And this, I think, is what caused us as Methodists to explode at that time. And that is, is that worship is ultimately about God interrupting our patterns and rituals to bring something new about. Yes, we repeat things over and over again, but God will interrupt things. John Wesley knew that. That's the reason why John Wesley went out into the fields and preached to people. We think of that as not very innovative these days because those kind of people annoy us. We're just going to the graduation ceremony. We don't need to hear you shouting at us from a bullhorn. But think, back in his time, that was considered something vile. You did not do that. If you're going to preach, you preach from a pulpit. You don't preach out in the streets. That's uncouth. You don't do that. But John Wesley knew, like, God was doing something new. And, and the gospel takes precedence over everything. John Wesley left space for God to do some new things. He understood that God is a God who will interrupt things. And that's ultimately what the psalmist is inviting us to do when we are invited to sing a new song. It's not about coming up with new songs so that we can be hip and trendy. We send or we sing new songs because God is constantly doing new things in the lives and hearts of people. And we want to sing about that. We want to praise God about the fact that he's still continuing to act. A lot of us worship as if God only worked in the world when the Bible was written. And once it was finished, God stopped doing anything. And so what we do every Sunday, we just gather worship and remember what God did back then. God's doing new things even now. That's why I say a part of holy worship is an understanding that God will interrupt things. If you look at the, the book of the Bible that, that is written on the formation of the church, the book of Acts, you will see that God is constantly interrupting things. The Spirit is moving in, in great ways. Paul says, I'm going to go over to this town. And the Spirit's like, no, you're going over here. And Peter's like, I'm only going to serve these people over here. And God's like, no, you're going to serve all these people. God is interrupting people because the gospel has to get out. People need to hear this good news. And so when we worship, we have to understand that God will interrupt things. And that's why today I want us to take what I call the Psalm 96 challenge. You all have Bibles, I assume. You don't have to have them with you. No judgment there. But you have a Bible. I want you to go open it to Psalm 96, and I want you to take a single verse from this psalm and make it the focus of your life this week. Just a single verse. And see what happens when the focus of your worship is less about you and more about what God is doing. I mean, imagine what our worship would become if we did that. And to know that to sing a new song is not about making it up as we go along. No, it's about taking every opportunity to worship God. Knowing that any moment... God might, with his spirit, break out into this world when you're walking down the grocery aisle, when you're going through the drive through when you're calling up an old friend. Yes, even when you're coming to church for worship. God might break out and do a new thing. Friends, the good news is God is doing a new thing in us. God is doing a new thing through us, and God is doing a new thing for us. God is all in the business of restoring people, of rescuing people. God, even now, is rehabituating us, retraining our hearts, reforming our hearts. God is always doing a new thing. 
And friends, I think that, more than anything, deserves a new song. Let us pray. Lord God, we open our hearts to you today because you are the potter and we are the clay. We pray that you would refashion us, reform us, that we might become better worshipers of you. Lord, help us to not make worship about ourselves, but rather to be something that is truly about you and declaring your goodness, declaring your holiness, declaring your righteousness and declaring how you are doing a new thing in and through us. So Lord, restore us to that vision of worship so that we might worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, we are thankful that your spirit meets us where we are, not where we imagine ourselves to be, but right where we are. And you are ready more than ready to bring us along deeper into the heart of worship. So Lord, make us faithful only unto you that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. For our final hymn this morning, hymn number 431, Let There Be Peace on Earth, I ask that you would rise in body or in spirit as we sing this song together. Before I get to uh, the benediction this morning, I once more want to express our gratitude this morning that Sheely is here with us to play. As you know, you and she and Laura are both graduating, so they've obviously got other things to do, but we are so uh, grateful that she was able to be here uh, with us and play for us this morning. Well, friends, hear the good news that God's love is for each one of us. And God is ready to pour that love into your heart this day. That if we are attentive and open to his word, he will most surely pour that love into all our hearts, that that cup of our heart might overflow with God's goodness and God's grace. May you go today proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and making that as your prayer this morning, that there would be peace on earth. But let it begin with us. 
Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.